The Neoliberal Podcast is part of the Neoliberal Project and made possible by our members and supporters. If you enjoy the podcast and want to become a member of the project, head to neoliberalproject.org slash join. You can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash neoliberalproject. These members and patrons help cover the podcast's expenses and make it all happen. Thanks for your support, and enjoy the episode. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Neoliberal Podcast, part of the Progressive Policy Institute. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson, and joining us today is G. Elliot Morris. Elliot is a data journalist for The Economist. He's very well known for his election models of the U.S. and other uh, countries' elections, and he's the author of the new book, Strength in Numbers, How Polls Work and Why We Need Them. And that's what we're talking about today, is the general world of polling and election modeling and why these things are important at a basic level. So, Elliot, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So, I've got to say, this is, this is a treat for me because I've always been a stats nerd. And, you know, I, I did my master's in statistics a long time ago and punished myself by taking years of graduate level math and... And so to finally get to talk to somebody who actually uses that math, um, rather than just plays around with politics all day like I do, is, is a, it's a real treat. I, I feel like this is one of my holy trinity of uh, interviews. It's you, Nate Silver, and uh, Rachel Bittekofer. <laughs> so <laughs> all, all three of you guys are about the same level, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I'm going to get you in trouble right away. We're going to start a, uh, a war. But but no, it is it is a really treat, and the book was really interesting. I've I, I got a chance to read the book because you were nice enough to send over a copy, and I guess my first question is just about why write this book in general? Why write a book about polling? Obviously, you work in polling, and the the dumb answer is well, polls are important because they tell us what people think. But on a basic level, you can actually just say that doesn't really answer the question. It just extends the question to why do we care what people think? So it, it it seems a little obvious, but why should we, you know, care what the public thinks about about policy? Like, what's what's the baseline here? Yeah, well, to to start at an answer to your question, um, I right. So I'm a, so at the Economist, I I write our election models, but I also just consume political polls to write about, you know, what people want, whether there's an imbalance between what they want and what the government's getting, just the state of public opinion, because it is of interest. Um, and through the course of that reporting over the years, so I've had this job for, you know, four years, I've been modeling elections a little longer, closer to six or, uh, I guess, seven years now. Um, I, you know, I, you notice, right, that like, polls, get things wrong pretty often, um, or or at least they can miss the mark. I guess we wouldn't really say they were broken or wrong, or at least I wouldn't, and we'll get to that. Um, but uh, there's a pretty profound disconnect between how often that happens and the magnitude of past predictive errors for pre-election polling and how they get characterized in the media. So after the 2020 and 16 elections, for example, you get people writing articles that like, never trust the polls again, or like there's a catastrophic error in the polls that make us think we can never sort of trust what we know about the people. And that's just not, that's just not true, really. So I started writing this book as a corrective to that, to say, well, you know, uh, if you, you know, look at the historical accuracy of polls, you, you, whatever, there's like two points of error. And maybe these two points of error we've seen in the past elections in predicting the Democrats vote share nationally is like not something we should overreact to. Um, but, you know, over the course of researching that question, how accurate are the polls? What, you know, what makes them more accurate? How do polls work? I discovered a much, I think, more interesting and more profound story. And that question you frame as sort of a dumb one, why should we listen to the people is actually pretty profound. Um, yeah, I, I was surprised because when I dove into the book, I, I was thinking, this is going to be a book about technical election modeling and filled with technical detail. And it was probably had the wrong expectations, but 
it actually, yeah, very, it starts with this very philosophical approach of like, when did people first start using polling methods of any kind? And, and why did they care? Like this was back in the day when you didn't often have to care that, that much what people said about the government sometimes. Yeah. So, you know, when you're researching when polls started, we got scientific polls in the early 30s and 40s, right? Readers or I guess listeners will be familiar, of course, with George Gallup, the man who created the Gallup poll. Um, But they even go a bit further than that in this uh, iteration of what we call straw polls, um, which are less scientific. They're surveys at like military musters, which are gathers uh, or gatherings of military militia members and Fourth of July parades. But then, of course, there's like a long democratic tra- tradition to wondering what the people want from their government. I mean, if you're going to have a democracy, that is the entire ball game right there. So that's where the book starts. And um, I think any discussion about polling really should have that framing. Um, something, you know, we... we you know, readers of the book will notice throughout the book is that 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 is like the main thoroughfare in the book is that these aren't just tools for predicting elections. They're tools um, of democracy, of much more importance. Um, And and so that's why I ended up really writing the book. Um, There's this quote at the beginning of the book is sort of traced throughout from the president of the American Political Science Association in 1995, who says, that polls do what democracy uh, alleges to do, which is to give every single person an equal chance of participating in the democratic process. And I really uh, want people, or I I guess I should say is sort of the reporter role here. That's how pollsters view their work. And I think there is a mismatch here between how the public views the polls um, and sort of what they're doing and the promise that they offer us. So that's why I wrote the book. Yeah, it was really interesting to read both the the historical details about, like you said, musters, where um, I I think that's probably where the phrase like to pass muster comes from or something like that. Yeah, that's but, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And to read the historical details about some of these very early instances of, of like very proto polls, basically, and then also just the philosophical arguments, because you can really go back like into ancient Greece when people were like debating in the very first democracy, like, is democracy actually good? Should we care what people think? And it, it's a tricky question from a political science and, and philosophy standpoint that, you know, how, how much should we care what people think and how often should we respond to them? And, you know, if you go down one road, that can lead to like direct democracy if you go down another road, it can lead to like, we don't care what people think at all. So uh, do you have a sense of how you approach that problem in terms of how do we balance that democratic impulse of like, we should always be checking what people think, and we should be doing what people think. And that's why polling is valuable. It tells us what people think. But then also, you know, people will point out there's a lot of problems with like direct government by referendum or something. You, you can even look at states like California, where there's some referendums there that have been ridiculous. And it's some people argue it's too easy to do state referendums in some of these places and direct democracy would be a disaster. And how do you think about balancing those things where you want to get people's opinions to have a democratic government, but it's also not the kind of thing you can just max out that value? Yeah, so that is the sort of philosophical question I think that the book raises. And in the earlier chapters, I offer one answer, but I should clarify, right? Like it's not a philosophy book. I'm not going to be giving people the prescriptions for direct or indirect democracy. I guess the starting place- Elliot Morris has solved philosophy is what I'm hearing from this. (laughs) Certainly I am not. um, I mean, I would consider myself like a fan of democracy, but I'm not going to be the one sitting here saying we should be like ancient Athens, right? And we can get into why that is. Um, So in the first chapters of the book, I- preview some political science evidence on this question of whether or not, first off, leaders are even listening to the people and whether or not they can have informed opinions or if their opinions aren't informed, if they're still useful. And the political science here essentially answers yes to all of those questions, though, I mean, it's not necessarily an emphatic emphatic embrace of... um, the people's ability to, sh- to steer the ship of state or like to inform every Washington debate. So I think the way to think about this is, 
um, we, you know, the starting point is we live in a direct democracy. So we have already, or sorry, we live in an indirect democracy. So we've already conditioned on the political system here. We've already said people deserve some chance in their government and the say of what their leaders are doing, their elected leaders, but also their unelected leaders, bureaucrats in, in Washington, um, people making decisions in committee hearings or what have you. And all, all those systems should be tied to what the people want. And so therefore, um, pollsters, uh, especially George Gallup, after he in, sort of invents the first scientific public surveys, and of course, there are surveys uh, uh, in other areas like academia and the census, um, but he's the sort of first public pollster doing this in a scientific way, not not surveying the military musters of the 4th of July parades, but going door to door, or in some case, sending out mail ballots and asking people what they think and gathering the information. Um, and after he invents this method, he relies on some writing by a British American statesman, a man named George, sorry, a man named James Bryce, um, who wrote uh, two very long treatises on American government and government worldwide, and specifically focusing on the public opinion question. How closely should uh, the government you know, sit to the people? And uh, George Gallup, you know, well, he's a pretty big fan of this. He coins the term the pulse of democracy to describe polls as something that basically should inform the government on like every question of the day. George Gallup is a big fan of um new of the new england town hall and he's a big fan of what he ends up calling a rolling referendum where every question of the government gets asked to some degree of the people and informs debate um but it is important that george gallup never goes to so far as to say the people should decide everything in fact he maintains that this is a pretty bad caricature of a pollster throughout his career and he wins the battle i think most of the way, but there are some academics at the time and later who criticize this use of polls as like giving people too much power over their government. So I'll sort of clarify for myself what the book is arguing is certainly not um, that there should be a government by survey, what Sidney Verba calls a government by survey, but that they should be informing the the public and uh, the press and politicians on what uh, the people want. And so I'll just, you know, say one more thing here. Um, Evidently, in American politics right now, there are some huge disconnects between what the people want, as told both by polls and you know, other indicators, like, I guess, protests um, in general, sort of outrage, uh, and and our observed, uh, as I would say, quality of life, um, that show the Americans, Americans are not getting what they want, uh, especially in things like gun control uh, or abortion. Um, they're not getting what they want from the Supreme Court recently in things like, I think, the regulatory state or protections for the climate and balancing growth sort of uh, in the economy with, with protections for nature. Um, and if, if you ask people on these things, they generally support, like, I guess what we would traditionally call the liberal or progressive uh, stance on, on these issues. And they're not getting them probably because of the counter majoritarian systems of American democracy, right? The system or the Senate overweighting the votes. Uh, of rural senators or rural people. Um, it's the same thing happening in the House and then therefore also uh, through the presidency and the Electoral College and and um, the Supreme Court. But the point here is really that like we wouldn't know that without polls. We wouldn't be able to push on the government and say you're not representing the people and maybe you should be without the polls at all. And so that's, I mean, that's really the message of the book here is like to use these data. And it is big data. There are a lot of polls on every question going back almost 100 years, 90 years now, um, to inform what the government should be doing for the people they pledge to serve. Um, and, and, you know, that that's sort of the philosophical takeaway I want people to get from here, or to get from the book. So whenever you talk to people about polling, the first thing that anybody's going to want to talk about is how the polls get things wrong. And this is both the people who think polls are all fake news and the people who are well-informed but are still worried about the state of polls. But before we get into, like, what's gone on in the last couple of, like, U.S. presidential election cycles, there's an interesting history of this happening where polls have always kind of been – 
you know, one cycle, they seem really great. They're getting all the answers right. And then another cycle, they're very clearly wrong and they embarrass themselves. And there's these big prominent scandals or embarrassments. And, you know, if we think about this, polls as the having an ability to forecast what is going to happen, this has a long history. So can you talk a little bit about that, how the whole 2016 and 2020 issues with the forecasting, these are not new things. Yeah, so what what I'll say is that people should rethink their usage of the word wrong or of the words wrong or broken in this context of polling. Um and it's very important that they think of them not as binary signals as saying in 2016 for example that Hillary Clinton is going to win the presidency or in 2020 that Joe Biden is going to win 342 electoral votes or you know whatever the average uh in all the possible scenarios was according to the election forecasters um but that polls even when they're aggregated together or put into a forecast are only estimates of some broader quantity i guess in this case it's like political who you're going to vote for but it could also be like what flavor of coke do you like cherry coke or regular coke or <laughs> right and each one of these questions um uh, or to get at, at answers to each of these questions, pollsters engage in statistical exercises where they are essentially drawing 1,000 Americans at best, really on average for the sample size of a poll, to represent a broader group of like 350 million people. And while the statistics say you can do that, there's some degree of error that comes with your sampling. Um, there could be uh, you know, too many white people or black people in your sample. There could be too many Democrats or Republicans in the case of election polls. Or maybe you have too many uh, rich and well-educated voters, as in the case of the 1948 election polling debacle, you know, where like the Chicago Tribune plastered Dewey defeats Truman on, on their newspapers, according to what they thought the polls said. And of course, that's not, I mean, history says that's not, that's not what happens. Um, and so that's a sort of a long way of me saying I reject this idea. I fully reject this idea that the polls were wrong. No, in fact, I think it's important to be <laughs> precise with our language here that um, the, the, the estimates were biased. Let's use this word bias instead. Um, and, and that's because if they are surveys um, and, and they're relying on statistical sampling, there's something going on downstream in the science and art of that data collection. Um, that is causing the polls to misfire or be biased. And it's important to ask what what that might be. Um, and, and so I guess, you know, we could talk about 2016 and 2020, but just to, to go backward in time, that bias in recent elections has been an average of like two percentage points towards the Democrats. Now, before basically 2016, this error ping-ponged around toward the Democrats on one hand or toward the Republicans in the next election, um, and that bias today is much smaller than it used to be. So these first so-called scientific surveys by George Gallup in 1936, they underestimated Franklin uh, Roosevelt's margin of victory by 12 percentage points. Now, of course, that's like way better than the Literary Digest poll, which was off by 38 percentage points. <laughs> but, you know, like polls have gotten a lot better at what they're doing, I guess. And once you think of polls as uncertain estimates of something, I think we set the terms of the debate to... Uh, better ask the question, what can they be doing for the people rather than just like, what um, what, what could they be doing to help us handicap elections? And, and that's, you know, one thing I discovered um, in researching the book, and that's the story that it tells. So let, let's talk about 2016 and 2020 then, and let's get into a little bit more detail. If it's not correct to say that the polls were wrong, if instead they were biased, can we talk, I guess, about what they got right and what they got wrong? Because it's um it's it's a little bit too simplistic just to say well they had about a x point you know bias towards the democrats because you know in theory in our perfect world that wouldn't happen there's you know so many different polls being run that standard of error should never go the same way every single time and and so how does it end up happening in 2016 and 2020 that that the polls were kind of systematically biased in this way. What's the story behind that bias? Yeah, so the story I tell in the book about the rise of polling aggregation in um, 2006 through the present day 
is uh, what's informing this idea that if you average the polls together, then, you know, on average, they shouldn't be biased because, again, um, every election cycle, you have some group of people that's like not answering the polls, but then the pollsters fix that. And the next cycle, they have some error going in the other way. That's the idea historically. And so therefore, you can average all these surveys together. And if they are statistically unbiased samples where between each individual poll reading in the election year itself, um, the errors are going to cancel each other out, you'll have perfect precision. But this motivating idea for polling aggregation is wrong. Um, it was never true. And of course, polling forecasters and aggregators will tell you that. They say, well, that's why we simulate uncertainty in our aggregates. But A, first off, there's not always a margin of error or uncertainty bars or what have you on these aggregates that people publish. There are, you know, there is when people are doing an election forecast, that's what you're doing. You're asking how much can I trust these data. Um, but uh, that's a pretty big step forward in the statistical analysis of polling. And so what we have to ask ourselves like today, sitting here in 2022 in July before midterm, we have to ask ourselves is, okay, do we trust these polling aggregates as things that are unbiased? Uh, meaning that like Republicans and Democrats are equally likely to take a survey across surveys when we know that's not true. And do we present polling as some sort of, I guess to use the, the statistical terms here, a central estimate that Democrats are up by two points on the generic ballot or whatever. Jo Joe Biden's approval rating is minus 14 points. Or do we say, well, here's what the polls say today. Uh, Republicans plus two on average, and then very quickly caveat, but we don't know if we can trust those polls because we don't know if Republicans are answering at as high of rates as Democrats are. Or do we, um, and, there, and like on top of that, hey, the polls can also move. So do we now, instead of like publishing R plus two, do we show a range that says, you know, R plus six to D plus two, you know, with a four point margin of error, whatever it might be, it might not be four points. Please don't think I'm saying it's four points. <laughs> um, and, and then sort of let that like more weather forecasty prediction um, stick and be more clear to people. Now, maybe it's not as sexy journalistically and it's not going to be as successful, but you know, my, the book says that this is, you know, after the telling the story of polling aggregators, people like Charles Franklin, Mark Blumenthal, um, Doug Rivers, Nate Silver, of course, sort of arrives at this conclusion that uh, it's, it's time for a bit of an iteration in how we're communicating how these polls are working. And that starts with, of course, understanding how the polls work. And so that's why, you know, that's why that's the subtitle of the book. I, I think it's really important to get at these sources of error because I would find it very confusing if I didn't have the background that I have, because there's more than one way that that we can think about why a poll might be wrong or or I might not to say wrong but why a poll might be different from the final result you can think about you know the 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 standard kind of statistical idea of margin of error that just through random chance you might accidentally sample too many of this person or that person and so margin of error is always a thing but then separate from margin of error is bias and it's it's a little bit tricky to actually kind of really understand on a deep level the difference between bias and margin of error and then you've got even other concepts like you know it, it's it's july right now as we record this and the numbers in july are predictive of the numbers in november but they are not exactly the same there's an error over time that happens or change over time and so you've got kind of all these different sources of of error coming in that are all different and and honestly, I don't blame people who kind of get confused by all of this and just want just want polls presented to them in a simple way. Yeah, I, I think fair enough. But the, the point that you're making here is the point in the book that, hey, there's lots of stuff that can go wrong in using a poll to predict an election outcome, especially ahead of time. So why not use these things? as rough indicators in our journalism. Instead of expecting polls to provide laser-like accuracy at forecasting elections or pegging the support of Americans or the percent of Americans that support legal abortions in most or all cases or whatever, what, let's use them like, you know, like politicians use them, I, I would say, which is rough indicators of public opinion. 
and then move on from there. And um, if we can sort of reprogram our brains, if we can change the channel away from using these things to predict every single outcome with certainty or whatever, and despite what election forecasters try, that's how people are going to some degree, that's how people are going to ingest the numbers. And we can change the channel to, okay, what, what can we use these data for, for much bigger, to solve much bigger problems for the American people, like the, you know, democracy problem, like the most fundamental problem in a democratic society, basically. I wonder what you think about the criticisms that, that many people had after 2016, especially of both the polls themselves and then of the election modeling. I don't even know if it counts as an industry, but just the practice of election modeling, because the, that certainly came in for a lot of criticism. Do you think that most of that criticism was uh, deserved? Do you think that some of the criticism was over the top? Um, did election models actually do that badly in 2016? Or was it somewhat exaggerated how poorly they performed? What, what's your perspective there? So the way I digested the polling information in 2016, toward the end of the campaign, um, was that Hillary Clinton was up like three percentage points in the national polls, right? Or, or you know, whatever the precise number was. I think it was about three. And on average, going back, you know, from 1948 to um, 2012, on average, polls missed the share of the vote um, or the margin in the vote for the Democratic candidate by about three points. I think back then it was like 2.8. It's higher now because there's been higher polling errors. So that tells me that, to quote a really great article by, you know, now CNN analyst Harry Hinton, then at 538, that Donald Trump was just an average polling error away from winning the national popular vote in um, the electoral uh, in the presidential election. And that's before you even get to um, the, the risk that polls are off systematically at the state level where things, you know, were even closer in some cases, depending on sort of what poll you were analyzing and how you were adjusting for certain factors. Um, and so I, you know, I'm sitting there in 2016 thinking, okay, well, listen, polls, polls aren't perfect. Uh, they're pretty good, though. So if they're right this time, or if they are as prone to error as they have been historically, Hillary Clinton will probably win. So 538 said, okay, they're doing basically the same math. That's like a 30% chance. Um, if everyone in the press had done that exact exercise and sort of did the 30% chance, I think the conventional wisdom would have been a lot better calibrated and people would have been more scared, or I guess more expecting of a Trump victory than they were. And so that makes me think that people were relying on some of the other election forecasts that weren't done with as much uncertainty or, you know, didn't have the right correlations or whatever between states, you know, whatever the problems were that showed uh, Donald, you know, Hillary Clinton with a 99 or 98% chance that went in the election. And maybe they were making their decisions yeah, based these off were, of that. I mean, these when, were forecasts like uh, Sam Wang, I think, at the Princeton Election Consortium. And uh, the New York Times had one. And these were just, obviously, in retrospect, wildly overconfident. And and there's even, I got to say, there's even some damning quotes from some of these people who, uh, it, leading up to it, and, and I, I'm not, I don't actually remember whether or not you were producing a forecast then. Did you have a forecast in 2016? No, I was in college then. I, I did yeah. have a forecast, but not for a major news outlet. Yeah. So, I, but I remember some of these places literally kind of putting mockery on Nate Silver's name because, like, it's like one to two weeks out, and he's got Trump with a twenty percent chance to win, and they just find this absurd, and they're literally making fun of it in interviews. and And I look back at that. I, I researched it some when we were getting ready for this interview, and it was really some of the quotes are bad, Elliot. They're they're bad. Like, I mean, just yeah, is that kind of your take as well? That just there were some people out there who did this in a fairly, I don't know if thoughtless is the right way, but certainly not precise, not accurate way. Well, so I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't call it thoughtless. So, so here's the story from the book. The story from the book is of the uh, forecast run by Huffington Post pollster. I mean, there's, there's a you know, story in the book, obviously, of Nate, Nate Silver running his model in 2008 and 2016 also. Um but in 2016, the sort of arc of the book at this point is 
in questioning whether or not these election forecasters are always going to be good or how much we have to think through the statistics of this thing to be relaying information to the American people about what they think, um, which is really hard to do. These models are very complex. And so in 2016, you have Natalie Jackson running the statistical model at the Huffington Post pollster. And she's sort of told very, at least to her retelling, very curtly by the higher ups that they are going to do an election forecast, period. They're going to put something like 538 on the homepage. And either she could get on board and write one very quickly, I might add, at very compressed you know, time horizon, or they could not do it and something, I guess... Uh, not to directly quote uh, Natalie at this point, crappy would end up on the homepage. Um, and so she makes this decision, okay, well, I, you know, Natalie is a um, PhD political scientist. She has done polling in the past. She knows how polls work and how they are aggregated. Um, and she has other people on staff at Huffington Post Pollster, which beforehand was owned uh, or run, I should say, by this trio of political scientists and pollsters, Charles Franklin, who is a professor um, at Marquette University, lives in Madison, Wisconsin, um, uh, by Mark Blumenthal, who's at the time, I think, a, a sort of consultant, you know, moving between the, the worlds of private and public polling and punditry. And then um, Doug Rivers, who had previously invented essentially a type of um, online polling. He now is the director of research at YouGov, and he sort of invented the methodology that YouGov uses to, to study um, Americans' public opinion online, um, and and they had you know you know they had put up essentially election forecasts themselves in the elections before 2016, um, and they had uh, relied on a, a Australian uh, political scientist Simon Jackman to do their own election forecast in 2012, which got all 50 states right because the polls were like really good in 2012. Um, or, or, you know, they, they underestimated Obama's margin of victory, so they sort of underestimated in the right direction, and so they, like, seemed very good. And so she's in this environment where, you know, she she knows she knows her trots, so she writes this model, um, but it doesn't have a large enough standard error on it. Uh, her, her model essentially thinks that polls are going to be relatively unbiased because of the aggregation process, um, and though they could be their errors could be correlated. It doesn't necessarily have a large enough, or I, I should say evidently doesn't have a large enough margin of error or what we call a standard error or enough uncertainty in the model. Um, so it's not thoughtless. She certainly knows what she's doing, but sort of the way she tells it retrospectively is that she was hurried and sort of didn't have the time to think the process through. And now also she's, you know, making this statistical forecast, I might add, in a news environment that is, very liberal, the Huffington Post, right? It owns pollster.com. And although they're straight shooters, they are responsible to the political editors and the owners of the Huffington Post who do not like Donald Trump. And so you don't necessarily also, also have the feedback mechanism that yeah, could cause I, you to double If think. I remember right, Huffington Post actually for a while said, we're not going to talk about Donald Trump because he's too awful. And they eventually had to give it up when he literally won the primary for the Republican Party. But there was a period of time they literally refused to cover him. They were, right. And so there's yeah. this quote at the at the end of the campaign. There's this article written by, I think, the politics. I think he's the editor at the time, Ryan Grimm of Huffington Post, um, of the politics section, I should say, um, where he says Nate, Nate Silver's putting his thumb on the scale. And that was like a wrong article. It was empirically false. It was thin. There was, you know, there wasn't proper sourcing or whatever. It was just a wrong, bad article. And and that's the type of thing that Natalie and the forecasters at Huffington Post poster are having to compete with. Now, I'm not like making an excuse for the 98%. I think it was probably wrong. My own model when I was in college was like closer to 16%. I think it was 84%, which was about the same as the New York Times, I should say, almost exactly the same. Um, and, uh, and anyway, so the point from the book is not to defend these people, but to say, right, this is a, this is a complex problem. It's not that people are like making up numbers here is that they have to make assumptions because this isn't a hard science. It's both a science and an art. It's true for polling and for aggregation. Um, and, and they have to program those assumptions statistically. And then they come up with a model that they have to interpret for the people, which is like also a very hard thing to do. And so you're in, you end up in this environment where there's so many layers of extrapolation and abstraction from what you started with, which was the measurement 
itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And with, you know, the right statistics on the right time, that is something you can get right. I think election forecasts on average are um, evidently, like empirically unbiased on average. Historically, they're less biased than the polls because they can rely on other information. Um, but we have to wonder whether or not we're doing the right thing here or if we're doing it optimally. And so those are the questions that the book tries to answer. And I'm not going to give you the direct answers there. You're going to have to buy the book and read it. <laughs> yes, everyone buy the book. It's strength in numbers. It's out in every bookstore that you could want it at. It's at Amazon and everywhere else. Um, but you know, I, I remember those those battles and there was a lot of recrimination afterwards about one thing that has always stuck out to me is the the correlations between states that I think a lot of the models that were kind of supremely overconfident didn't account for the fact that like if Pennsylvania misses in one direction, Wisconsin and Michigan are probably going to miss in the same direction. Those are going to be highly correlated. And I think there were some models, I forget who exactly, but there were some models that basically just didn't take it into account. But with all that said, we did end up having a miss and, you know, people who were properly kind of uh, calibrated in terms of, you know, knowing how much error to put into the models and, and knowing how much uncertainty should be there, it, they came out pretty well. I think the more troubling thing moving forward is the idea of non-response bias. And this is something you mentioned earlier, uh, very quickly, the idea that, you know, when you actually conduct a poll, when you actually have to go out there and do this, whether it's a, a phone call or over the internet or whatever it is, what you're hoping is that you can get a random sample. And what you're afraid of is that there's some way in which your sample is going to just be biased because Republicans or Democrats just don't pick up the phone in the same way or don't respond to the online click in the same way. So... What do we know about non-response bias in the last couple of years, and and how have we been trying to kind of get around it in this cycle? Yeah, so this is the defining characteristic, I think, of polls in this era, in the era where our information ecosystems are fragmented based off of our partisan ID, where our trust in others and institutions has become correlated with our party ID. And so therefore there are pronounced and um, seemingly uh, very uh, robust, well, I should say, um, very sort of like sturdy. Um, it's, it's reliable to guess now that Republicans are less likely to answer polls. And that's true within demographic uh, groups. So uh, if you weight all of your data to be, so, so the way pollsters sort of compensate with getting um, or, or comp- compensate for getting unrepresentative groups of Americans uh, in their samples is by so-called weighting them, using a statistical algorithm to say to their computer, hey, ch- check the percent of people in this poll that are white. And if it's too high, then you're going to count all the other groups as more, um, for more. And so therefore you get a balanced poll. And so they do these statistical tricks for all manners of demographic uh, strata or groups. Um, but if if the white people in your poll are, or, you know, the, the well-educated or the, the young people in your poll are all systematically less Republican um, than they should be based off of, what, you know, what the election outcome turns out to be, there's really no way to fix that with the previous way of thinking about adjusting polls for demographic non-response. Now we're in an environment where partisan non-response presents much harder problems for the pollsters. And that's because there's no number, there's no reliable, hard and true, like government survey number like there is for the racial composition of the electorate for the percent of Americans who are Republican and Democrat. Basically what you're saying is that like, if you don't have enough Hispanics in your poll, well, you can just go look for more Hispanics, right? Or or take the Hispanics you do have and, and give them a higher weight. But yes. if you just have Republicans not answering the poll or, you know, I've heard David Shore refer to this as low trust voters, uh, but there's no way to like go, oh, well, let's just go get some more low trust voters because they don't have like trust tattooed on their head or anything like that. 
Right. So they don't have the trust. You also don't know what share there should be because you don't have like a government survey asking people in the same way year after year as pollsters are, you know, do you trust the government or whatever? Um, and so, so we're in an environment now where even if you weight your surveys perfectly by demographics, you are going eventually to end up with a poll that's politically unrepresentative anyway. That's that's new in the long term, like history of polling. That is a pretty new phenomenon to be running into this problem year after year. It was t it was true in 2016. It was true in 2018. It was true in 2020. It was true for some polls in 2021. And I would wager that it's going to be true in 2022 also, uh, at least for most pollsters. It might, you know, we might run into the case where aggregation solves the problem or, or I should say masks the problem, not solves it. Um, and the way, the way out of this is mapped out at the ending of the book as sort of a like optimistic take on the polls. There are a few ways that pollsters are trying to adjust for partisan non-response or um, to, to fix the problem even beforehand. And that is, if you are, here, here's like the question that pollsters are asking themselves. It's, if we are not getting Republicans to answer our polls on the phone at the same rate as Democrats, or online at the same rate as Democrats, what if we try a new mode? What if we mail them surveys? What if we text them? What if we even go door to door? And so you have big pollsters in America today, like the Pew Research Center, like SSRS, which does polls for CNN, like uh, the pollster who does polls for the Associated Press, which is um, NORC at the University of Chicago. They have all assembled new online panels of respondents that they recruited over mail. And in Pew's case, they're getting response rates to their mail surveys of, of almost 30%. Uh, in the optimistic cases. And so to give you a comparison, like your average online or your average uh, telephone poll today gets a response rate close to 1% if it's lucky, if it's a good poll with a very in tune or attuned um, uh, population. And and that's a, you know, that's actually a pretty bright spot. They find that if they weight their surveys to the partisan composition in this higher response rate mail poll, uh, uh, then their surveys that they're weighting based off of their online panel are much more accurate. So um, they, they say, you know, this is a promising way, not a surefire solution, but a promising way to reduce partisan non-response in the polls that we're getting. But it's super expensive, right? So um, that's the downside here is there's going to have to be a lot more investment um, in the methodologies, in new methodologies and technologies for polling, um, but, but they're promising. So just to give you one more hard statistical number here, in 2020, um, the average error for Joe Biden's uh, vote share in among all polls was about two percentage points nationally, or two percent. So they they guessed he would get fifty four percent of the two party share, and he got fifty two percent or so. Um, uh, online polls and live caller phone polls did about as good as each other um, in, in this endeavor when they were mixed together, um, but they both suffered from some non-response that was relatively solved, maybe it was luck, maybe it was something more profound, um, by pollsters doing their polls over text message and pushing people. So you get a text message that says, hey, we want to we poll you, and pushing them to answer the survey online. Those polls did better. They had lower error at, on election day. And so that's all, that's all pretty promising. And um, pollsters, you know, going forward, or they're leaning into these technologies, they're doing some, some other things which I describe in the book called mixed mode samples, which combine samples from all different types of polls, online, phone, um, web, what have you, uh, and, and are you know, trying to come up with even more reliable estimates. So uh, I guess the, the broader like point in the book here is that there is a march sort of, sort of toward progress or towards like perfection with pollsters um, or with polling that every time they they get something so-called wrong or the, the that their bias increases significantly they try to find new solutions so this first big polling error in 1948 causes pollsters to go from quota samples to uh, area random area sampling to make sure they were getting people from all over the county not just like one part of the county and then they moved to polling online which was cheaper and even more representative and then they started trying to figure out how to weigh, ways to capture people online. Um, 
which was a little bit more expensive, but promising and has now um, sort of 20 years later been like really figured out. And those polls are almost exactly as good as live or maybe in some cases even better than live phone or green polls. And now we have this like one last one more iteration, which is how, how do we solve for partisan non-response? Um, and that's the question that pollsters have are sort of answering if they want these data to continue to be, to be relevant, both for the election forecasting, yeah, sure. But I'd argue the much more important thing, which is like informing the people and politicians um, about, about public opinion. Yeah, it's it strikes me as really difficult too, because we're just such a polarized society and, you know, the blue cities are getting really, really, really blue. And the rural areas continue to get way more red and way more Trumpy. And, you know, it's it this strikes me as a related phenomenon that it's it's hard to get certain types of people on the phone because maybe they don't trust mainstream media in institutions or mainstream media polls because someone, I, I don't know who it could be, uh, is telling them that these things are not to be trusted. Um, so I, I don't know if it's just another casualty here, but I don't know. Some some of the people I talk to like uh, are very pessimistic about this, but hopefully it's something that we can solve um, because you know I, I imagine it'll be kind of a topic of discussion among all of the data wonks and all of the polling people in, in these aggregators. You know, oh, well, this poll has Biden plus seven in Wisconsin, but it's this type of poll. So you need to remember that it's not correcting for this type of bias. And and it's like another thing you're going to have to catalog in your head, kind of. Well, the hope is that forecasters and polling aggregators are doing that sort of accounting on their own, that they're looking very uh, particularly at every single poll that they're getting and they're cataloging for themselves okay, this poll is using the right demographic weighting scheme. They're making sure there are enough non-college educated white voters in it, but they're not trying to do anything for partisan non-response, so we put it in this bucket. And hey, look, here's one live caller phone poll, which seems particularly um, influenced by partisan non-response and has you know, a much larger uh, margin of error than we would expect. It like jumps all over the place between polls. So we put that one in another bucket. And here's this one other bucket of pollsters that um, are trying to balance their samples by partisanship. So they make sure maybe that there's the right number of Donald 2016 or sorry, 2020 Donald Trump and 2020 Joe Biden voters and non-voters in there um, as well as the demographic weights. So we put that one in one more bucket. And then, you know, with statistics today, you can, you can tell the model, this is what we did for the economist in 2020 and in our back test on 2016 worked particularly well you can tell the model, hey, look and see if there's any residual differences between these buckets. Once you account for things like pollster house effects, right, if one pollster is routinely biased versus another, or if one mode or population side is routinely different than another, see if there's anything else. So if there are differences after making those corrections between the polls that correct for partisan non-response, or at least tell you they're correcting for it, um, and those that aren't, then you can assume that that those that that difference there is something you want the model to take into account. You want the model, your forecasting model, your aggregation model, whatever, to be um, more reflective of the more accurate poll. And yes, yeah, sure, that that means you're make you're making this, you're like putting your assumption about these di systematic differences between the polls in your model. But you can account for the uncertainty of that assumption with Bayesian statistics. And I know I'm getting really technical here, but the point is, if there's been this big shift in the way people are answering polls, then there should be a corresponding or maybe even larger shift in the way that we're analyzing and communicating about polls. And I honestly don't think that the conventional wisdom has had that sort of reckoning, has made that shift. And one thing you're going you're gonna to read in the book um, is, is that I'm, I'm urging people to be very careful about polls writ large with their uncertainty, but also very discerning about what the better types of polls are, about which pollsters are thinking very clearly about these methodological problems versus those that might be ideologically biased or are just putting out estimates for, say, the like um, fame of their firm and how much money they're going to get for other market research pursuits or whatever. Um, and, and all of these things affect the final product, the final poll. Right. So, so once you, 
once we first make this mental jump, the sort of like changing the channel jump from polls are per <laughs> perfect laser like, you know, predictions to, oh, they're just statistical estimates. Then you need to start wondering, what are the things, uh, what are the decisions people are making? What are the sort of fundamental like facts of the statistical sampling of the science here? That's changing the eventual product, and should we be accounting for that? And I think that's a much more honest conversation about polls than the one we've been having. Um, and I'm hoping that the book is push the book will eventually push people in the right direction there. So we've spent a lot of time talking about election models and election predictions and and how those tie into polling, but that's not the only thing that polls are used for. And another kind of stance that you take in the book is about the usefulness of issue polling. And you seem a lot more bullish on this than potentially, you know, election models which have had their issues. Can you tell me why you think issue polling is useful? Well, the big reason that I'm more bullish here is that issue polls need to be a lot less precise because people expect sort of less of them. Uh, because they're not trying to distinguish between a 50 and 51 percent of the vote for a, for a candidate among likely voters. We haven't even talked about how hard it is to figure out who's a likely voter versus a registered voter, which is just another thing pollsters do. Another thing that enters the so-called data generating process here, which increases uncertainty for polling. Um, issue polls don't have to do that. They are consumed as, you know, rough indicators of what the people think on a given issue. When we talk about issue polls, we're already kind of talking about, oh, well, the question wording of this issue poll may, you know, may be subpar. Maybe I would ask that question differently. Or, oh, I don't know. We took this issue poll when the political environment was super charged up. Maybe we need to take another one. And politicians know all of that too. So they're saying when they see like 50 seven percent oppose of uh, or, or, uh oppose the dobbs decision to overturn roe v wade uh, i don't know what was that three weeks ago now um still seems like yesterday um uh, is that 57 percent meaningful can we take another poll um and if it's meaningful like what what should i do about that hey maybe maybe i'll take a poll of opinion in my district and then maybe i'll adjust my vote accordingly now obviously like i'm using examples of very politicized issues we have evidence, and the book goes through this political science evidence, of, of politicians changing their minds on more mundane issues. So there's this study of state legislators in New Mexico, 2008, uh, maybe 2010, I can't quite remember, um, uh, in which political scientists, or in which the legislature has a budget surplus, and they're asking, uh, well, should we give this budget surplus for transportation or education, or should we hold on to it? in our rainy day fund for next year. And that's a vote that legislators going, are going to have to make um, because of this budget surplus. And they have this budget surplus because the price of oil went up and New Mexico exports oil, so they had more money. Um, and so political scientists surveyed opinion in every um, state, dis uh, I think, uh, state house or senate district. Um, and then they relayed the information. They, re they relayed the share of people in each district actually in a random selection of districts um, on whether or not they should spend the budget surplus. Most districts wanted them to spend the budget surplus on public goods. And they gave half the information or they gave half the legislators the information in their, about their district and half of them didn't get anything. And they observed among the group, among this random selection, so it's an experiment, a statistical experiment, this random selection of legislators that got the information, they were much more likely to vote the opinion in their district than the other group. And then, of course, that's just like validation of the other anecdotes we have of legislators. There's lots of this <clears throat> in the 60s when uh, political scientists are first starting to uh, study the impacts of polls in which they directly ask legislators in Congress, uh, you know, do, you want <laughs> do you want information from the polls? Do you care what the people think? And there's lots of legislators who say, yeah, hell, hell yeah, I care what the people think. I'm a legislator. Like, I want I want to vote the way that, that my people think I should vote if they're making like the right decision. Uh, I, and if I'm, you know, if I vote the other way, I want them to vote me out. They're sort of very precise about this delegated connection uh, between between the legislator and and the public. Um, so the, the, the book sits, the book sits there with these slightly lower expectations 
for polls than for issue polls than pre-election polls. And for um, and in this and in this environment where they can be very influential, even sort of around the edges of really important decisions, like you know funding for school buses is is one of the uh, budget surplus items in New Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so that's so that's where the book sits. Yeah. So what you're saying basically is kind of like, look, polls are really good and useful. Just don't make them out to be your savior because they can't do that. They can't yes, carry exactly. all the yeah. weight for you. Yeah, and it's funny. I, w- I was going to come in with uh, a bunch of criticisms of issue polling because I have my bones to pick. But, I mean, it, it sounds like you're mostly, like, you're aware of this and you're you're on board that they're not perfect, you know, because I, I look at something like the issue polling for the Green New Deal. Well, there, you know, do you support the Green New Deal to help climate change? And, and it, it'll get a bunch of yeses. It'll be like 75% yes. But then if you, you know, poll individual items within the Green New Deal, a lot of them will have much lower individual polling. Or if you let people sit with it, it, it'll poll differently after a month. Or just the classic, you know, people tell you they like something, and then you pass it, and then they get mad at you anyway for passing it. You know, I I, I think about like, it's not a direct analogy, but I think about like the $1,400 checks that Joe Biden and the Democrats passed in uh, early in his term. And how, you know, is he getting any political benefit from that now? Or people just basically got passed and it got forgotten. But but what you're saying is, you know, yes, this is not perfect, but it is still a really useful thing to know. And and it's certainly better than having nothing. Right. What pollsters say and historians say about how polls impacted the presidency or, you know, other legislators is um, that these indicators are actually so influential, not so influential, right, as to change politicians' minds on an issue, but to help them reframe the debate about the, you know, particularly in the White House, uh, reframe the debate about what the White House is doing, um, that we shouldn't be, uh, or that, you know, that we need to be very careful when we're conducting those polls, the way we're designing the questions, or um, you know, basically making sure they're like not propaganda, um, and, uh, in order to give uh, politicians a good idea of, of where the public is standing here. Um, but we don't want to treat them with as much accuracy as to go around reporting, right? Oh, 50.2% of the public says they want legal abortion. Oh, therefore, we have to have legal abortion because this is what the poll says. So this is what I was saying earlier about the so-called government by survey or like of uh, the very, um, the extreme adoption of Gallup's uh, rolling referendum, which he, which was sort of a more advisory referendum than a binding one um, uh, in the book. So uh, I, I, I think, right, once we get to this environment, again, where polls are seen as uncertain estimates and we've adopted the mindset that they're important and we've looked at the evidence that says they inform the public debate and they make legislators vote in in certain directions to a certain you know degree of movement um then we have to design and report on them very carefully so that this very very important and like profound thing that's going on in the background democracy is affected in the right direction um and, and we're not you know, biasing that in turn. Uh, but so I think about this on the flip side, though, right? Like if, if we're taking the opinion that public opinion issue polls are all wrong and you shouldn't listen to them at all, what, what are we saying about whether the government should be listening to the people? Uh, because we know that the indirect correct connection between people and their government has been severed on some very key issues uh, in America, but also elsewhere. And we know that legislators, if given a long leash, will act in their own interest or in the interest of their corporate or what you know, whatever else interest groups, and not what their constituents want. So uh, it seems like your your only real logical or philosophically coherent choice, if you've adopted the idea behind democracy or even republican government, right? I'm not talking about direct democracy here. I'm just talking about people having a say in the government, then you have to give some amount of credit to these polls. You have to listen to them mm-hmm. some amount of the time. Yep. 
All right, so we're coming up on time soon, and our final question that we always ask on this show is, where can people go to learn more? And obviously, I will say for you, the very first thing people should do is buy the book. If you want to learn more about what's in the book, the best thing to do is buy it. It's called Strength in Numbers by G. Elliot Morris. But now that we've told people to buy the book several times, what else would you recommend for people who are just interested in this general conversation around the history of polling, the philosophy of why we need polls, around election modeling? For people who like this stuff, is there anything else you'd recommend? Well, in, in terms of... Uh, okay, hold on. I'm going to have to think about this before I answer. Um... And and this could be this could be you know a Twitter feed just somebody to follow who's really good. It could be white papers. It could be other books. It could be you know a, a documentary to watch. Just anything yeah. that you think would be good for people who are interested in this stuff. So there's lots of good poll polling books um, that are done in the past. They, you know they don't like connect the the dots in the way that I wanted them to. So that's one reason I I wrote the book um, that I wrote. But uh, I have blog posts on those books on my blog slash newsletter which is gleatmorris.substack.com um and that that'll have a bunch of really good recommendations too in particular there's a there's a good book out recently by um the i think she's a political scientist named susan herbst um about the troubled birth of public opinion polling um and she has another book about the history of polls called um numbered voices which is very good i would recommend both of them all right well i Highly recommend everybody go get the book. And once the election forecasts are out, we will certainly wait for those with bated breath. I had a lot of fun talking with you today. Everyone, it's been G. Elliot Morris. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was my pleasure.